generally, science is a wonderfully visual area. We get the better tools also to envision stuff we could previously not even see. It's most obvious, of course, in astronomy and microscopy, but especially in neuroscience, we have this enormous revolution where we have brain imaging. We don't need to cut open heads anymore to see the brain. We can actually watch the brain function in a healthy medical student when we annoy them with weird mental tasks or moral dilemmas. And of course, at least in lab animals so far, you can even modify them to see neurons shine up and literally change color or give off light when they fire. So optogenetics, I think, is going to be amazing. It's really very early days. We only had it for about uh, 10 years. So Ed Boyden and Gero Misenberg, who happens to work here in Oxford, they have kind of been figuring out how to address individual neurons, individual types of neural circuits and control them. It's kind of awesome when you meet somebody whose job it is to fire mind control lasers at the, in the brains of fruit flies. And I do run into people like that here in Oxford. It's even more awesome when you realize that, well, if it works in a fruit fly, it could work in humans. It's just that we have much bigger, messier brains and our skulls are not transparent. That's a bit of a drawback. So, so I think we're living in extremely exciting times in neuroscience uh, right now, mainly because we're getting the tools finally to actually start building really large models of the brain. Uh, so on one hand we have optogenetics and the various, various ways of labeling individual neurons to get a more fine detail. And then we're having the, the kind of slice and dice methods where you take a fixated brain piece, uh, you slice it up, you image it, either using optical microscopy or electron microscopy, and then you can start trying to trace it out, and tracing out the connector, what's connected to what. Right now, of course, it's a very small system we can do. We can't image a very large volume at high resolution, but that's already turning out to be a very interesting computational challenge. So as the data arrives, more scientists get interested in trying to figure out how to extract information. They develop tools, and that's going to allow us to scale things up. So I expect that over the next few years, we're going to see a, a, an enormous revolution in neuroscience as it becomes very data-driven. It already happened in genomics, uh, and it kind of completely changed how you did genetics and cell biology. Instead of uh, the, seeing it as a lab work where you were pouring liquids between test tubes, it turned into a, uh, going through databases. Now the problem is we have so much data and it's rather tricky to draw conclusions from it. In neuroscience right now, well, we're having small models of a few neurons, we have a few circuits, we have a, be, be, a bit of understanding of, but that's about it. Over the next decade, we're going to shift. We're going to have enormous sets of scan neurons, and we're going to be able to run enormously large simulations. Supercomputers are definitely good enough to run at least brains of small animals today. It's just that we don't know how to connect those virtual simulated neurons together in the same way that it would correspond to the brain. We have the right number, but we don't have the information to put into it. So the next step, I guess, is that we're going to start working on the very hard task of creating a pipeline from having a brain, scanning it somehow, turning that into a model and running it on a computer. Once that has been achieved and proven to work well enough, you can start scaling it up towards real brain emulation. But of course, the first steps are really hard. We don't know for certain what we need to simulate. Obviously, the electric impulses and uh, how they connect between different neurons. So we need to uh, figure out what's connected to what and the strength of the connections. But there might be other things in the brain too. So we need to develop better ways of testing our simulations, seeing that they're actually truthful, that we actually mirror the relevant stuff going on in our brain. Um, I'm a bit uncertain about it. There is an idea called epaptic uh, signaling uh, that has kind of been floating around in the neuroscience community for a while. So it's that the electromagnetic field surrounding an action potential moving down a nerve cell will of course affect the electric fields of other action potentials. So maybe they get synchronized. You can calculate it and it looks like it could work under some circumstances, but whether nature uses this or not, nobody knows. So some people, of course, say, of course it does. And others say, no, 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 we don't think so. If it turns out that the nature actually uses electromagnetic fields for some stuff in the brain, that's going to complicate simulations, not enormously. We know how to simulate electromagnetic fields too, but it's going to be annoying because we need to have a different kind of simulator. So I'm hoping the nature doesn't use it because it would uh, complicate things. But I know nature has a tendency to kind of annoy researchers by always using all available weirdness it can do. 
Uh, I'm somewhat hopeful that we don't need to do all the inner workings of a cell. I do think we need, need to simulate some of the internal chemistry, not just the ion channels and uh, the, the concentrations of different ions, which are already kind of part of a standard simulation, but also certain of the messenger systems. But I don't think we actually need to simulate every molecule or all the details about the internal metabolism. It might be that I'm wrong about this and we actually need that. And that's going to make brain emulation far, far harder. A real nightmare scenario would be, of course, that we need to know, care about where individual molecules are. And at that point, of course, the competition demand goes up even more. And of course, the ultimate nightmare scenario would be that uh, Sir Roger Penrose and other people think that there are quantum stuff going on in the brain. All right, in that case, I don't think we can do it at all because we can't really simulate a quantum computer on a conventional computer. On the other hand, then we would have a good reason uh, to borrow good ideas from brains to make quantum computers. My personal guess is that we need to do a compartment model level electrophysiology. You divide each neuron into small pieces. Each piece has its own electrical activity and interact with the other pieces of the neuron. You calculate how much of different ions flow in and out. And that's fairly well known. Then we add a bit of chemistry and probably a bit of chemistry and diffusion of the environment around it. Because some neurons, when they fire, they release neurotransmitters and other substances into the intercellular space that affect neighboring neurons. And that might actually affect some aspects of memory. So a really full brain emulation might actually contain a lot of biological details also about how neurons branch, cling to each other, send out new uh, axons and especially new synapses as we learn things. Again, that's messy, but it's not very different from what's already been done in some research. It's just that that area of research now needs to be expanded greatly and integrated with a lot of other research. So I think neuroscientists over the next few decades are going to be quite busy. And in a sense, I'm less optimistic about the neuroscience than I'm about scanning methods of getting data out of tissue and supercomputing models to run a big simulation. The hard part is always figuring out what can I get out of this data? What's the meaning of it? How do I turn that into a useful model? And notice that brain emulation is all about a very reductionistic view that we can simulate with small scale stuff without understanding what intelligence, memory or anything else is. And if we do it right, we're going to see the large scale stuff emerge from it. It's a bit like taking a microprocessor and imitating it transistor by transistor without knowing why each of the transistors are there. But if you do it well enough, you should get another processor that does the same job. It might turn out that this is the wrong way of going about it. Uh, but uh, I'm very happy to take that chance. I think we have a good chance of succeeding in the long run. Or maybe somebody else figures out how to achieve intelligence in machines beforehand. Well, so be it. <laughs> I think we, if we manage to simulate uh, brains uh, of small animals well, then we can scale it up relatively quickly. Uh, so, I, and so I'm most concerned about our scientific abilities, but I would expect them somewhere mid-century and later. So I have a very broad probability distribution. I don't think we're going to get them in any time soon in the next 20 years. But beyond that, I think there is a pretty good chance of getting them. It's going to be very much hard work to do it, but it's just hard work. It doesn't look like we need a genius insight, a new idea about how the brain works. So it's quite possible that in the pursuit of making a virtual brain, we figure out the construction principles that produce useful brain functions and just put them into machines. For example, the cerebral cortex is essentially just a set of the same circuit repeated again and again and again, but it can do very different things. Some parts of my cortex is doing vision, some parts are doing hearing, other parts are doing mathematics. The thing that the same little circuit can do all these different things. That suggests that if we could just figure out how to do that, we would have a really useful component for our machines. And it's not implausible that the research into simulating a cortex, which of course a lot of scientists are very interested in, might tell us that. And then we're going to end up with machines that use this bio-inspired subsystem. This might of course be a problem because it's kind of hard to create strict rules. If you want to, for example, control the safety of such a system, it might be, very, it might be the same thing like the safety of an animal. You need to train it to behave in a safe way. And you might not have detailed control or even understanding what's going on inside. You can't read out the neural activity of my brain because it's individual and rather messy. And similarly, these machines might also be individual and messy. We can, of course, make copies of them, which would be very convenient, but they would say, still have the same quirks. 
generally neuromorphic artificial intelligence it makes a lot of sense traditionally artificial intelligence have been borrowing some good ideas from neuroscience I don't think it's been borrowing enormous numbers of ideas actually when you make a listing you realize that you can probably count them with both your hands they have been fairly good ideas but they've also taken decades between a neuroscientist figuring something out and the AI researcher borrowing their version of it. So if neuroscience has some ma massive revolution, it's not necessary that's going to lead to a massive revolution instantly in artificial intelligence.